This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app or join our emailing list at coldwarconversations.com. Nathan Morley brings to life the story of the longtime leader of the German Democratic Republic. Drawing from a wealth of untapped archival sources and first-hand interviews with Honecker's lawyers, journalists and contemporary witnesses, Morley paints a vivid portrait of how an uneducated minor son from the Saarland rose to the highest ranks of the German Communist Party. Having survived a decade of brutality in Nazi prisons, Honecker emerged as an ambitious political player and became the shadowy mastermind behind the construction of the Berlin Wall in 1961, a crucial moment in 20th century history. Although frequently on the verge of being relegated to obscurity, he managed to overthrow strongman Walter Ulbricht at the height of the Cold War and reign supreme over the GDR between 1971 and 1989. However, by 1980, the Honecker honeymoon was on the wane as a decade of economic and social difficulties blighted the GDR. I'm delighted to welcome Nathan Morley to our Cold War conversation. Eric Honecker isn't the most inspiring or able of the Eastern Bloc leaders, but I suppose he ruled for uh, longer than most of the others. And, you know, I have, I've heard uh, Germans, especially East Germans, the younger ones, the, this generation, describe him kind of affectionately, believe it or not, as a kind of grandfatherly type figure. There is an element of that in the way you, we look at Eric Honecker. You know, he was looking at him, uh, an unlikely candidate uh, to be a hard man leader. But I think this was a kind of an illusion which he sincerely entertained. He was a pretty strong character. So why did why did I write this book? Well, he kind of stalked me as well from childhood. I, I was brought up in Germany from 1980. Honecker was a daily news item. What was going I was in the West, but obviously what was going on in the East was reported extensively in the West. And I was a huge fan, listener of shortwave and medium wave radio. So I was listening to Radio Berlin International, and uh, which used to actually play his speeches daily in, in English in uh, long form. They were quite uh, astonishing broadcasts. And I, 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 so, so from a very early age, I was interested in Honecker. Uh, and even was when I started my career in journalism by 1990, I was still in Germany. And uh, this was the period when he had kind of fallen from his perch and was being pursued in Moscow and which would eventually lead him back to um, uh, to, to a prison in Berlin. And of course, we were watching the, 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 the changes in Germany as the wall came down and a reunification. So, I mean, looking back at this period, was it was in 1989, 1990, it was incredible because we <laughs> kind of as a, we made a dash to Berlin as a family to survey what was happening in Berlin, and then we were in the Czechoslovakia in Prague uh, to see the changes there. And the, the, these were incredible times, fast moving. It almost seems in, astonishing when you go back to these places nowadays uh, to realise that this was just thirty years ago. Uh, so it was an interesting uh, period. The last biography of Honecker was written 52 years ago by Heinz Lippmann. It's a good book, but it was written from the distance of West Germany. Lippmann had kind of uh, hot-footed it from the East in the 50s and fled to the West. Uh, so it was written before Honecker kind of made his stamp on the GDR as he was coming to power in 1971. And then there was never anything written about after that. And, and it's surprising, really, because even nowadays, if you go to Berlin and or, or anywhere – in Germany, yes, but certainly the East. Honecker is a name known to everyone. His image still is at every museum you visit in, in Germany and so on. Uh, billboards across Berlin by the wall at the GDR Museum, at the Spy Museum, at, at the Allied Museum. Wherever you go, you'll see Honecker. Uh, but not a great deal is known about the man. It's the old cliches. You, you see hard man Eric Honecker, the grandfatherly figure. I was very lucky because I first uh, did my first broadcast in Berlin in 1990, I think 89, 90. So since then, I mean, I spent a lot of my life 
back and forward in in Berlin. And I've met a lot of people over the years, a lot of contacts. So a lot of these were utilized in this book or introduced me to other people, people like Ed Stuhler, who knew Margot Honecker very well, a good friend of hers, and uh, was a biographer of her in the end. Adam Kellett Long, who was the Reuters journalist in Berlin the night the war went up, still has crystal clear memories of that night and invaluable uh, um, uh, insights into what was happening. Jürgen Lipfin, I knew Jürgen a long time ago when I did um, first met him when I did a report for Deutsche Welle in Berlin about the wall. Uh, his brother was the first man shot trying to escape when the wall went up. Uh, Nicholas Becker was the lawyer for Honecker uh, on trial in when he went on trial in Berlin in in the nineties. Uh, so, so there were lots of contacts all brought together to help with this manuscript. It, it is a, it's a biography. It's not a deep political work. It's a biography, the story of a man's life. And I hope we've captured a little bit of Eric Honecker, the man in it. You certainly have. And there's so much detail in here that I, that I didn't know. So uh, I did find it a fascinating read. Now, let's start with uh, Honecker's early life. Eric Honecker's uh, early life, I think, is pretty much textbook communist leader um, uh, biography. Uh, he he kind of ticked all the boxes when it came to to his upbringing. His father was in the mines. Um, his roots were purely working class. He was the fourth child of Wilhelm Honecker and and Caroline, and had two brothers, Willie and Carl Robert, three sisters, Katerina, Frieda, and Gertrude. And his father was very active in the the miners' union. He was conducting the wages struggle. Uh, he had the trust of the workforce, but importantly, was always in conflict with the pits management. And then uh, th- this was kind of the early world that Honica, Eric Honecker was brought up in. And then his father went off to war in 1914. He was mobilized and joined the German Navy. And life during the war for for his mother and his family was difficult. They were living on, on Wilhelm's salary, which was very low. The food situation was quite poor in Germany, as you'll know. Uh, so Eric Honecker was quite affected by this point, and things got worse after the war when his father returned because Wilhelm's lot down the mines uh, contain increasing degrees of misery. And that's why Honecker always maintained that his father joined the communists, because he saw them as the best representatives of the interest of the of the, the interests of the workers. And this is the background of Eric Honecker uh, as, a, as a kid, from being a toddler to being a teenager, was this very tough, gritty, industrial coal mining background. And the misery was compounded with the death of his sister, Katerina, from tuberculosis, which, as you know, is a condition which kind of stalks areas plagued by malnutrition and poverty. And this directly affected Honecker, not just emotionally, but also in the fact that because of the fear of contagion, he was packed off to the safety of the countryside to avoid contact with his sister as she was withering away. So it was a pretty hard childhood all in all, I think. And and this is something which, uh, you know, shaped the rest of his life. Uh, his father encouraged him to become a member of the Young Spartacus League, which was a small but I think a very vocal communist youth group. At school, he performed OK, nothing special. His German language skills were, were pretty weak. Arithmetic was above average. He liked sport. He then joined the Young Communist League and was stomping around the region, handing out leaflets and propaganda. He spent a little time in the countryside, working in the country, and returned to his hometown in Wiebelskirchen as a teenager, uh, where he had a dream of of working on the railways. I mean, this was uh, his boyhood dream. It didn't happen. He became a roofer, working with one of his uncles and then getting a professional apprenticeship. All of this time he was an apprentice apprentice roofer. He was still very actively involved with uh, the Communist Youth League. And then eventually he uh, joined the Communist Party. Now, the Communist Party send Eric to Moscow. How does that shape him? Russia changed everything for Eric Honecker. There's no doubt about it. Not only this period of his life when he was actually living it there in in the Soviet Union, it stamped him for the rest of his life. And he continually throughout his career and throughout his life refers to in almost every interview he gave his time in Russia in some way or another. Uh, To paint the picture here, 
It was 28, 29 that winter. Unemployment was very high, around 3 million in Germany. The economy was contracting. Thousands of firms were folding. Uh, the country was in trauma, in anxiety. And Honecker was invited by, by the party to go to Moscow and study Marxism for a year. His parents obviously were enthusiastic about that. They said yes. And just before his 18th birthday, off he went with a stop in Berlin. And imagine that. Berlin at that time uh, was was literally a riot. And he, he, he kind of visited the gritty districts where there were street battles and brawls between the communists and the Nazis. And he did a little studying in Berlin as he saw the dying days of the Weimar Republic. So he was exposed to that for a little while. Then on to Moscow he went. And that was the turning point in his life, as I say, Moscow. He was enrolled in the International Lenin School in uh, the Arbat area, um, which uh, was founded by uh, the uh, Comintern in the 1920s. With that, that's the, the, the body which governed communist parties around the world. And uh, the Soviets directed huge resources into educating foreign students and sponsors. And they picked up the tab for this, for his accommodation, his food, his lessons, everything. So they were, they were creating good communists from, from around the world. And Eric Honecker was one of them among students from America, Africa and Asia. He was in the German section, so he shared a dormitory with people he would come into contact with many years later when the GDR was formed. So he becomes a good student. He, he memorized the ABC of communism um, away from the classroom. He, he worked in a labor brigade. He was allotted as a, a welder at a, a, an electro works in Moscow because you had to you also, you know, kind of earn your keep as well. He developed a love of the cinema and he had a romance. Uh, he, he fell in love with a, a young a Russian girl, and they had a romance, and that was strictly taboo because she was a factory worker and he was not meant to do that. Uh, and uh, it's also important to mention, I, I suppose, Ian, because this was... Um, Harry Conacher was a very good-looking young guy. If you, if you, I don't know uh, if, if, if you've seen pictures of him at this period in his life. I mean, he was a, a, an athletic handsome young man. He, he um, obviously was a red-blooded red -blooded bloke. That was something which would stay with him for years. He had appealing facial features, windswept blonde hair. He, he learned to ride horses, play football. And um, also during this period, uh, he um, part of the, the experience was joining um, members of the Young Communist Labour Brigade, and he was sent off to the Ural Mountains in Siberia, to build, to build a Magnetogorsk. This was one of the great Stalinist projects. And um, it was there. He, he was kind of with a pickaxe digging at the mountain as they built Magnetogorsk. And I remember he, he said quite clearly in his own official biography, which was published in 1980, 79, 80, uh, that he was working in 40 degree heat. There was no trees, no greenery. They were working day and night, living in tents. Uh, there was no technology. Everything they did was by the sweat of the brow, by muscles. Also, when he got back to Moscow, this is important, another kind of life-changing experience. He had two encounters with his hero, Joseph Stalin, okay, from a distance, but he saw him. Uh, he once said this was the greatest thing he ever experienced, was seeing Stalin uh, when he um, caught a glimpse of him at the Communist Congress at the Bolshoi in 1931. And then soon after, he saw him again in the Great Hall of the Kremlin. Russia was a really life-changing experience for him, a year, an unforgettable year, and loaded with all of this, these new experiences, he headed back to Germany. When he returns to Germany, what sort of state is the country in at this point? The country's changed a little bit. I mean, it's, uh, it was unstable when he left. It was in an equally chaotic state when he returned. But his work in Moscow landed in the job as a, a local secretary for agitation in the Saarland for the Young Communist League. And he got a monthly salary and he was able to apply what he had learned in Moscow as a, a kind of a low-level functionary. He wrote articles for the local papers, gave speeches. And actually, he was, according to some of the people who knew him at the time, including um, Eric Voltmer, who was uh, the editor of the Saarbrücker Zeitung, a newspaper in later years, I mean, he was a pretty superb 
speaker during these years. Now, this is interesting because Honecker is later known for being a dreadful speaker, a dreadful orator. He had this strained, high-pitched, silent accent and an awkward manner and this monotonous style of delivery. That all came later in life. Um, he, you know, When he was older, he was quite unengaging and stiff, dull, boring. There was no kind of illusion of spontaneity or any impromptu movements with Honecker when he was older. But, and also actually, one thing you'll notice is he, he always spoke without a full stop or a comma. It was like a waterfall. But at this period where we are now, in 1930, when he was a young man back in Germany uh, in charge of agitation in the Saarland, he was pretty good. He would stand on street corners, his blood was hot, and he was known as a good orator. He was a good organiser too. He never really got involved in the rough and the tumble, the fights which were going on between rival factions and and uh, parties, but uh, he, he, he cut a pretty impressive figure. And of course, what happens next? Uh, the, the, the communists are so focused on their rivalry, their ongoing rivalry with the SPD that oh, amongst that the, the, the Nazis sweep to power. As you know, that's another story, but it's told in the book. And of course, we all know what happens. Hitler comes to power. And before you know it, the communists are being targeted by the Nazis who are then in government. And of course, they are then outlawed. The party becomes illegal. So Eric continues his work. He goes underground, um, delivering, continuing to deliver propaganda. He works in the south of uh, Germany. Um, he eventually winds up in Berlin in uh, the mid-30s, and he continues distributing illegal propaganda. He's caught, though, uh, right there in the center of Berlin, uh, spotted picking up a case full of illicit material at the Zoologische Garten railway station, the zoo station right in the center of Berlin, manages to dash through the Tiergarten as um, police officers follow him in hot pursuit, but he manages to get back to his apartment only to be arrested the next morning. And uh, he's then dragged to the Gestapo headquarters in central Berlin, the very building which is now the topography of terror, uh, which uh, later became him. Well, actually, at the time, it was Himmler's office. And he was put into an underground cell and uh, spent a year and a half there before he was brought before a judge. Uh, they, they were sniffing for blood. He was charged with preparation of high treason alongside the severe falsification of documents and sentenced to 10 years penal servitude. And then he was uh, given, uh, he was marked prisoner number 52337 and moved to Brandenburg, which was a huge uh, prison in the, in the middle of the forest um, west of Berlin. It was, it was known as the German Sing Sing because uh, it held like 1,800 prisoners. And it was a huge, I think it was the largest penal institution in Germany. And it was a pretty brutal place as well. Uh, most of the people in there by this point were political uh, prisoners, and Honecker would spend seven years there in, uh, in, in this prison. Some of it would be in solitary confinement, and some of it would be in a three-man cell until the outbreak of war, when, when things did change, because he was then drafted into work brigades to clean up bomb damage, and fix roofs. This is where his old occupation came in uh, very handy. He uh, was at a prison in central Berlin as well during this period. He began an affair with a warder, a Nazi warder, um, and uh, they carried on this uh, illicit liaison. And um, he even made an escape attempt in the last year of, of the war. Uh, and so all in all, it was a pretty traumatic experience with the prison, the war. Uh, but in 1945, I mean, amazingly, he was there as the Russians approached Berlin and was liberated. And uh, it was after this a new chapter in his life began. So Berlin in April, May 1945 is a devastated city from Allied bombing raids and from the uh, Soviets fighting over it. Um, what, what's next for Eric in this wasteland? 
Remarkably, uh, Eric Honecker survived the Battle of Berlin. He survived the guards at Gordon, who were panicky. Uh, you know, there were executions. And he made it back to Berlin at the uh, end of April 1945 and most probably uh, spent a week in the apartment of uh, his lover, the warden from the prison, Charlotte was her name, and she had a little place in uh, Landsberger Strasse. He then emerged into the rubble. The war had by this point finished, so this was around the 8th of May, sometime around there, a week or so around that point. And uh, luckily, as much of his story is luck, um, a friend introduced him to Walter Ulbricht, who had just arrived in Berlin as leader of the German communists in exile, and he had been busily preparing in the Soviet Union for the establishment of some kind of communist post-war Germany. Uh, they met at the Rose Restaurant, which was where he was holding his uh, meetings. Ulbricht liked Honecker. I don't think there's any doubt about that, and uh, offered him a, a kind of post in the youth movement, which he had been doing, as, as I explained earlier, uh, back in the Saarland. So almost immediately, it seems that Eric Honecker was back on his feet, not just some crummy assignment. He was there with the main man, Walter Ulbricht, who he had never met before. Uh, but suddenly he um, found himself with a position and uh, the only way was up from there on. I, w I will briefly mention that he married the warder. Um, this is something which was pretty much airbrushed from his life history because the, the warder, Sh Charlotte, um, was, of course, she was working with the Nazis. This didn't reflect well on Eric Honecker. So the marriage was quite secretive, really. I mean, I don't think it was something he advertised or shouted about. And strangely enough, um, she died a few years later from some kind of brain tumour or a neurological ailment, but she was airbrushed from history, never mentioned in his official biographies. And I'm sure that was something of a relief to him because uh, I, I believe that she w would have hampered his career. They, they argued a lot. Um, she refused to join the party. Uh, she refused to give up work as well. So it wasn't really a, a marriage made in heaven. Charlotte dies, and almost immediately, Eric is involved with his uh, deputy from the Free German Youth, uh, a woman called Edith, Edith Baumann, who was actually very influential within the party as well. And she was a lot older than him. So it was very, you know, she was influential, she was older, and they started this affair and they got married and they had a child. I don't think it was a love match because by the early 50s, Eric Honecker, who, who was a, a bit of a Romeo, I think that becomes clear in the book, uh, was having a, an affair with a, a, a much younger woman, a much younger functionary, a, a girl called Margot. Margot becomes a key figure in this story. What's the person actually like behind the, the photos and the uh, film footage that we've seen of her? Well, let's talk briefly about Margot because she has such a dreadful reputation. Uh, we all remember her, uh, or the media, certainly the Berlin media, used to call her the Purple Witch, and um, they really did paint a, a pretty horrific picture of her. But let's go back to 1949 when this affair started in Moscow. Uh, Margot was like one of the bright young stars of the Free German Youth. She was short, she had brunette hair, beautiful skin, high cheekbones, a great sense of humour. She was intelligent. And looking back, Eric Honecker said, you know, he was absolutely fascinated by her. He was, he was captivated by this pretty young girl. He said, first of all, he was fascinated by the fact that she was so active in the party. And Ed Stuhler, who was her biographer, actually was telling me a few years ago, he's no longer with us, sadly, but Ed was saying, you know, she was lively. She had this infectious, loud laugh. Uh, she, she was a bit, you know, she was a, a real character. Uh, so they had this wild, impromptu affair. It was very spur of the moment to start off with, and then it became serious. And Eric had actually fallen in love, I think, and the affair continued in Berlin. And um, Edith found out she was absolutely furious. She wanted her man. She basically wrote to Walter Ulbricht saying, kick this Margot girl out of Berlin, send her back to the provinces where she comes from. Anyway, it didn't work out that way. It, it was a bad patch for Honecker because, it, you know, he had married one of these senior functionaries in Edith Baumann, and suddenly he was embroiled in this situation where he was having an affair with a young girl, a young functionary. 
Uh, Ulbricht wasn't very happy, but he didn't intervene. And eventually, Honecker left Bauman. She wouldn't divorce him, so he was kind of living on and off with Margot. And it would be years before a divorce would come through, and then they would eventually get married. In this time, Bauman left uh, the, the Free German Youth. Ironically, Margot took pretty much her position in the organisation. That's how events carried on until the uh, kind of mid-50s, 53, uh, 54. June 1953 is a key date in East German history with the workers' uprising. What happens to Eric and Margot during this period? Uh, as you know, there was a workers' uprising, huge demonstrations in Berlin because of these endless quotas which Walter Ulbricht was publishing, meaning workers were working harder for no extra pay. They tried to appeal to him to change his mind. Even the Soviets said to him, come on, calm down, Mr. Ulbricht, but he didn't. And um, the, the workers demanded the termination of these ridiculous quotas. They wanted better working conditions as well. This culminated in a march on Central Central Berlin, when workers down tools, it all got very violent, and as you know, was uh, squashed on the 16th of June, 1953, by Soviet troops who brought in tanks. So where was Eric during all of this? Well, he wanted to be on the front lines, or at least this is what he says he wanted. Uh, but in the end, uh, he, along with Margot and Ulbricht and the entire party, the higher echelons of the party, were uh, whisked off to the. Um, Soviet headquarters on the other side of the city, and basically kept in protection. When the uprising was over, um, which which happened quite swiftly, they were all chauffeured back to their mansions in Pankow. But it was a real wake-up call. The party hadn't expected this. It was a bolt from the blue, and questions were being asked. How on earth did this happen? Why were we caught off guard? And attention, a little bit of attention, after a while, turned to, to Eric Honecker as well, of saying, you know, <laughs> couldn't you see this coming either? The upshot for him was uh, he was eased out of the Free German Youth and, and sent to Moscow for re-education. So this is the time after Stalin's death. Um, how does Eric get on? This is the time when Khrushchev gave his famous speech denouncing Stalin, the secret speech, which Eric got wind of. Uh, this was in February 56. So Eric heard about this. He was in Moscow. It was being whispered what Khrushchev had said, uh, calling uh, Stalin a, a despot, a dictator. And Eric, in, a, in an interview in 1990, said he was so angry by the whole thing, he tore down... Uh, a picture of Stalin from his bedroom wall. And I think that was about as far as his uh, dissatisfaction went. Anyway, at the age of 44, I think he could kind of view his career with some achievement, some contentment, because he was called back to Berlin and um, in July 56 and resumed family life with Margot and his daughter, Sonia, that had a daughter together, moved into a spacious home in Pankow, a lovely it's a beautiful place, still is, a cul-de-sac with century-old trees, very pretty. And uh, he was appointed, Ulbricht put him back on his staff. He, he got a very important job. He was appointed as the Central Committee Secretary for Security Issues. This is a big, big remit. He becomes suddenly, from coming back from Moscow, he becomes the man in charge of the police, in charge of state security, and the National People's Army. That's uh, one heck of a promotion. Indeed, as you say, it's a huge role and a crucial role at this point in East Germany's existence as uh, it's facing a massive exodus of its population. Honecker's new job as head of security, was he had his plate full. Uh, he had to ensure that the noose around the GDR was strengthened. This was in the light of a huge exodus of people leaving East Berlin for a better life in the West. Uh, since 1949, around 3 million uh, Germans had left the East, and that continued to rise in the late 50s. Uh, in July and August 1958, around a 1,000 people a day were packing up and leaving. And this um, was caused by political crackdowns uh, and the, the higher standard of, of living in the Western world. There were more opportunities for a liberal way of life in, in, the, in the West. So... Uh, it got really quite critical in the late 50s. I mean, during 58, for example, during the first half of 1958, 
621 doctors and dentists left, 1,392 school teachers, uh, 85 scientific assistants, 200 professors. It, it just went, it was an endless flow of talent and manpower going west. And uh, it, 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 the, the point is that the, the state wouldn't survive this. If it continued at this rate, it wouldn't survive. And of course, uh, this is where a light went on in Ulbricht's head that something had to be done about it. Um, but at the same time, uh, Ulbricht was em embarking on a socialist revolution to, to, from five to seven year planning. And in agriculture, uh, he made some disastrous decisions in agriculture. So farmers were also starting to pack up and leave, uh, leading to food shortages and, and, and problems in, in the economy and, the, and, and food supply. It was a bizarre situation. Uh, and then it became apparent that something needed to be done because if they carried on at this rate, there would literally be no one left. Um, and uh, that's when the, the, the kind of the germ, the, the seed of a Berlin Wall uh, was planted. So we arrive in a 1960. Uh, Eric and Margot move to Wandlitz, which is a beautiful wooded settlement in the north of Berlin, uh, which uh, is still there. Uh, nowadays, it's a health, um, it's a kind of sanatorium place for the elderly. It's a, it's like a theme park, this sprawling great settlement in the north of Berlin. Eric had this very strange house, and I was allowed in it recently. Um, uh, it, it looks like a suburban detached house, the kind of thing that a, I don't know, a bank manager would live in. Not, not very ostentatious at all, little garden. And he lived next door to Walter Ulbricht, who had an identical property. Really quite bizarre. So they left Pankow. The reason they left Pankow and went up to Vondlitz was because of the threat posed in 1953. It was considered by their Russian masters they were no longer safe from the public, so uh, it was better to have them nicely ensconced behind concrete walls and barbed wire uh, where they could relax, and they built a pretty nice safe haven. Uh, Wandlitz had um, everything that the GDR didn't have. Uh, supermarkets selling Western goods, spa, swimming pool, garden centre, free petrol, drivers, a cookhouse where dinners were delivered to their homes. Uh, so the, the the entire Politburo and those in the senior positions in the GDR all lived at Wandlitz. And um, Honecker always claimed he never really liked it there. He, he said he, was a, he wanted to be in Berlin amongst the action. And I think there was a little bit of truth in that, but he certainly wasn't complaining because it was uh, an extremely comfortable lifestyle. Uh, they didn't have to pay for food either. That was delivered by a car to their homes in the evening. They simply phoned through to a kitchen uh, and uh, which was cooking 24-7 and, and, you know, ordered what they wanted. And uh, just going back to my Eric Honecker's house, I will, because uh, it, it was a very interesting little visit. My, I've been to Vondelitz a few times, but the, the last time I was allowed in, because it's now being used as a surgery, a doctor's uh, uh, consulting room, it had just seven rooms, just 180 square metres, uh, a little tiny private guard garden. Uh, in fact, his rent was 370 marks for the house, which included furniture and fittings. Imagine that compared to Ceausescu and other <laughs> leaders in the, in the Eastern Bloc. Uh, so he lived quite a, um, I, I suppose in comparison to others, uh, quite a frugal life, but certainly not in comparison to the people of the GDR. So I will briefly mention Margot as well. By this point, uh, she only had eight years of elementary school on her CV, but <laughs> miraculously, she rose to the post of Deputy Minister of Education and became involved in the, the development of the East German school system. Uh, and uh, she actually made huge changes. Uh, she centralized the curriculum. Um, uh, she backed a law for the introduction of polytechnics. Uh, she developed technical schools and um, creches. She introduced creches across the, the, the GDR. And um, she introduced a scheme to build hundreds of new schools. So she was pretty active in that role. How are plans going as far as trying to uh, stop this exodus of East German citizens? Khrushchev gave the green light for Ulbricht to thrash out a kind of program of action uh, for the division of Berlin because most uh, most of those escaping the east or fleeing the east were going through Berlin. So it was decided this uh, plan of action would be drawn up by Eric Honecker, who was head of security, and he was appointed the chief of staff of a, of, a, of this plan uh, to to seal off Berlin. 
And the refugee problem continued. The plan was uh, underway. Eric Honecker moved into a little office just off Alexanderplatz. Honecker made very detailed drawings um, of, of the separation of Berlin, the separation of the U-Bahn, the S-Bahn. Uh, also, there were places where the border would go under the under the rivers and canals. There would be underwater barriers to prevent swimmers fleeing. This was all being planned in great uh, secrecy. And there were regular handwritten reports on the project's progress being given to uh, Ulbricht and to the Russian ambassador, even though that Khrushchev, had, importantly, still had not committed to building a wall at this point, he was still kind of interested in a plan, could it be done? And before you know it, the green light has been given. And uh, from here on, the operation proceeded with absolute precision. Berlin was um, to be uh, divided. The operation to divide Berlin is codenamed Operation Rose. How smoothly does that operation go? So the Berlin Wall is um, something he was secretly, I think, very proud of. And uh, it was quite an achievement, an amazing achievement, not just to uh, plan this wall, uh, but to actually execute it in one night and keep it secret at the same time. So on the 12th of August, as the evening progressed, uh, troops started to block the windows of apartments on the border with corrugated iron. This was all done very quietly, in secret at first. Uh, then 20,000 armed men fanned the length of uh, the, the border. That's 160 kilometres of border uh, to halt traffic from east to west. It's now after midnight. Most, most people are asleep, so not many people know what's going on. And uh, all eyes, as far as the security services were concerned, were on Honecker because he was up this night. He was dashing back and forward around the border area, watching the the, the operation take place. Uh, he was there as the, the these sharp coils of barbed wire were being unravelled and spread out across road junctions. And uh, by four in the morning, he returned to his hideaway in Alexanderplatz, and uh, the phone call came through uh, that the job had been done. Uh, RIAS, the radio station in the American sector, which was very popular, actually not just with West Germans, but with East Germans, first reported just on after their four o'clock bulletin that some sectors had been shut off and they weren't quite sure why. They thought it might have just been an exercise or a temporary operation. Uh, but then as the, the day started to dawn, by six o'clock, it, it, it was completely sealed, airtight. The whole border had been sealed off. And Honecker told his staff, OK. He glanced at his watch and said, we can go home now. So within the space of just five hours, Berlin, one of the most famous cities in the world, uh, had been sealed tight. The amazing thing with uh, with this operation is we, we talk about it being secret and Honecker was very proud of how secret it was. And I mean, it really was. Uh, I spoke to, to people who were there involved in this operation and people who uh, were witnesses to it. Adam Kellett Long was a Reuters journalist. And he told me, I mean, he was on duty that night. There had been kind of an air, some feeling that something wasn't right in that week before this happened. But he was absolutely stunned when he discovered what was going on. And he was dashing back and forward in his car as uh, the operation was going on through the night. You know, he said, you know, I, I, I was a man who knew what was happening in Berlin. He, he, in Berlin. he had contacts in the SED and he, he had, you know, he knew all the right people. Uh, but even he was shocked. And then, of course, there was the, 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 um, the citizens of the GDR, uh, and I spoke to Gunter Litvin's brother, who was the first man shot at the border trying to make an escape. And uh, Litvin's brother, a, a, pr a pretty uh, streetwise young guy, said, you know, no idea this, this, this was going to happen. It literally uh, came like a bolt from the blue. What effect does this success of the operation have on the East German population and economy? And how does that success affect Honecker's status within the East German hierarchy. The 60s is covered uh, in quite extensive detail in, in the book, but what I'll do br is briefly walk you through. From the um, construction of the Berlin Wall, there was an increase in living standards right across the GDR, and the situation started to normalise. Honecker, in his position as head of security, um, made sure the wall was secured and the border was enhanced, and uh, the, a kind of normality uh, descended over, over the, the German Democratic Republic. Public, but as becomes clear in the book, Honecker's relationship during the 60s with uh, Walter Ulbricht uh, began to sour.
Sauer uh, and uh, Honecker's relationship at the same time with uh, Brezhnev uh, was was getting stronger. They had a, a fairly good relationship. They were both hunters. Uh, you know, they were kind of uh, had a kind of pally uh, relationship. Anyway, Honecker. Uh, with Brezhnev's, uh, Brezhnev's blessing, managed to topple his master in 1971. And that was remarkable because having survived 50 years of purges and power struggles, Ulbricht uh, w- was toppled by, you know, his, his uh, young protégé. And from here on, he slipped quietly into oblivion. And I think it's important to note that Honecker actually, when all is said and done, never had an easy relationship with Ulbricht. When Honecker took over the leadership, uh, he actually started to erase Ulbricht from history, renaming schools and the factories and sports stadiums and even pulling biographies of Ulbricht from the shelf. Um, so, so it was, uh, it was a pretty sad ending to, uh, to a long relationship. And, and of course, without Ulbricht at the end of, of the Second World War, Honecker would have probably returned to Wiebel's Kirken and become a roofer or returned to his job as a roofer. But anyway, here we are. This is what happened. Uh, Honecker's in power. It didn't take long for him to cement his place as a Kremlin favorite. He cozied up to Brezhnev and the leadership of uh, the Soviet Union at any, at any given opportunity. And, and uh, Brezhnev developed different degrees of closeness with uh, European uh, with his European comrades uh, I mean we know from his body from Brezhnev's bodyguard that Honecker sought the hardest to ingratiate himself whilst Ceausescu of Romania uh, used to be such an arrogant char- character he he kind of saw himself and behaved as if he was the head of the Warsaw Pact so I think of all of the leaders within the Soviet uh, bloc and within the Soviet sphere of influence uh, Honecker was one of Brezhnev's uh, favorites, and uh, and that worked very well for Honecker. It was a position he was happy to uh, to keep. Behind the public face of Honecker, what did he get up to in his uh, leisure time? He loved his leisure time. There's no doubt about it. And the older he got, the more the more leisure time he enjoyed. His passion was hunting. And he uh, used to spend most of his free time uh, outside Berlin, on the outskirts of Berlin, in an area where, funnily enough, Hermann Goring, the Nazi minister of aviation, had a hunting lodge. Uh, he had a place called Carrion Hall. He blew it up, actually, just as the Second World War was, was ending. Anyway, Honecker had a hunting lodge near there and devoted a lot of time and energy uh, to his hunting. He had been got interested in, in uh, the 1950s when Clement Gottwald, who was the leader of the Communist Party in Czechoslovakia, gave him a gift of a hunting uh, gun. So the first thing he did was learn to ha- how to use the rifle. And over time, all of his close friends, members of the Politburo, also became a keen, ha- keen hunters. So a lot of male friendships developed as, developed as they were out shooting. Alliances were forged. And th- there were kind of many momentous decisions made on boozy hunting trips. And also he used to take diplomats hunting as well, including the American ambassador. And he would hunt every Thursday afternoon and spend a lot of the weekends out with his gun as well. He had uh, specially commissioned Land Rovers, which he designed so the gun could sit on the the back and he could take aim. Uh, It was really quite an expensive hobby as well. And I have to say that most of the bills for this pleasure were picked up by the state. Uh, So it was um, uh, an expensive, but for him, an extremely pleasurable passion. And I think Margot approved because their their relationship was never very easy. So a lot of the time he wouldn't be at the the marital home in Vondlitz. He would be, you know, uh, 50 kilometers north of uh, north of home uh, shooting. I, w- I will mention the, f- the funny thing is that even though Honecker w- was out and about in the forest shooting, uh, his bodyguard remembered that e- everything was done properly. The, 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 his trophies, so to speak, were measured, photographed and certified. And this became a ritual when, once they uh, got their, you know, their catch. They brought it back to the uh, hunting lodge. And Honecker was very exuberant, always very excited, like a kid 
uh, after the hunts. But what was remarkable is that he never ate anything that he shot. He never ate anything from the forest, not even mushrooms. And occasionally Margot and the kids would come up and they would pick mushrooms. He didn't eat game or, or, or anything. In fact, he had a, a passion for... T- for tinned food and sausages and sauerkraut. So um, what what happened to the the game that he caught? Most of it was carved up and and kind of handed out to his uh, security detail. Incredible, incredible. How was Honecker viewed in East Germany versus Albrecht? So generally in office, uh, Honecker was. I, I suppose, kind of seen at the start as a breath of fresh air. Um, I mean, he was there. He was the man responsible for signing the Helsinki Accords. He he kind of he felt that he was on the international stage. Of course, there was the, when he was in Helsinki, he was photographed next to Gerald Ford. I think there's a little bit of a chapter on that in the book, actually, about how he how he kind of stage managed the whole thing. There he was, kind of putting the GDR on the center stage. He was also keen to promote the GDR are as a great sporting nation as well and of course uh, we later discovered uh, about the huge doping scandals in the in the GDR we devote a whole episode to uh, the doping of east germany's athletes it's episode 264 and i'll leave a link in the episode information and and he wanted also to uh, build prestige projects. I mean, much of the Honecker period was uh, was one of great construction, such as the Palace of the Republic, uh, the Parliament Building, which had discotheques and restaurants, and you know it sits there right in Berlin, near, near where the opposite where the dome is. Though these were in 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 many ways good years, the good years for the GDR. Uh, then, of course, bigger events took over because the. The recession, the world recession in the 1970s, uh, was compounded by the oil crisis. This sparked a rise in raw materials. Energy cost more to import, and uh, the USSR couldn't provide as much uh, raw materials as it had been. Uh, Farmers had a bad grain harvest, and this prompted a lot of of cost-cutting measures across the uh, German Democratic Republic. And the economy started to get a little bit shaky. Um, the, it, it, it was really the big turning point. Suddenly, Honecker was taking out loans from the West, which he couldn't pay. And uh, the economy really then, I think for the, the late 70s into the early 80s, it became the most dominant feature of his daily life, was how can we make ends meet? There were times that they couldn't even afford to import proper coffee because of you know uh, they needed to do to pay for that with hard currency, so they ended up producing their own blend of coffee, which was universally unpopular. So there was a real kind of a desperate, almost a scramble to make money any foreign currency any way they could, and it really became a very tricky situation for the. Uh, the German Democratic Republic, uh, basically staying afloat. And we've got to remember at the same time, a very similar situation was happening in Poland uh, that was living way beyond its means, also in in Romania, which was taking out huge international loans. And the Soviet Union itself was dealing with poor harvests, um, a higher fuel costs, and the economy there was teetering. Now, amid all this, I think it's important also to mention that, uh, you know, we're talking about Eric Honecker. This book's about a man. It's about, about uh, you, you know, this this character. Uh, he, uh, for, for him, even though the, the GDR was going through difficulties, it was important to maintain face and to, to be seen on the international stage. And that's something he really started to ramp up in the, in the late 70s and early 80s. He embarked on trips to Africa, making donations to uh, organizations across the, the, the continent. He was in India, uh, Cuba, the Caribbean, uh, and he became really a kind of a, a, a an international figure, instantly recognisable with the white suits and the and the and the and the little hat. Um, so this was important for him, and I think for for Brezhnev, who was increasingly senile by this point, but actually, you know, as it was lucid enough to know of Honecker's value, he he actually encouraged these foreign trips and and uh, Honecker's international uh, contacts. So from the outside looking in, it looks like East Germany is a stable and relatively prosperous country, but uh, that's about to change. So the 1980s, well, um, these were bad years. His relationship with Margot is increasingly fragile. 
Uh, they they kind of live they live in the same house in Wandlitz, but they pretty much live separate lives. They've both had countless affairs. She's had several uh, uh, affairs, uh, which that became the, the subject of huge rumours in the GDR. Also, at the same time, Russia is struggling uh, with its own economy. It's also struggling to support the uh, German Democratic Republic with subsidised fuel and raw materials. Um, Brezhnev is going increasingly senile. Of course, the USSR invades Afghanistan. And, of, and and the Kremlin was also knocked off balance, as indeed was Eric Honecker, uh, when the communist uh, rulers in Poland started to grapple with uh, widespread shortages, which was a kind of symptom of, of their foreign debt problem. But things worsened quite swiftly in Poland. And as, as you know, a, a group of shipyard workers in Gdansk uh, staged... An illegal strike, a strike in the communist world. It was uh, it was incredible. Uh, led by Lech Wałęsa, uh, they drew up a list of twenty one demands and refused to leave the docks. We have an excellent eyewitness account of those strikes in Poland. It's uh, episode one five two, and again, I'll leave a link to that in the episode information. This was incredible for Eric Honecker, you know, to see um, workers d- 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 dictating what happens in the state and his memories of 1953 came flooding forward. And there was a Warsaw Pact meeting held on um, uh, the, the 5th of December in in Moscow to discuss this situation. And Honecker called for extreme measures, i.e. military measures, to, to clamp down on it. Of course, that never happened. But there's no doubt about it. Poland really shook him up. And uh, it, it kind of showed him as becoming kind of a uh, frosty, rigid, hardliner. Uh, the, the kind of the man we had seen in the early 70s, who was a little bit more open, uh, had, I think, by this point, started to vanish. As, t- as time went on, he he became even more of a frosty character. We we saw the death of Brezhnev, his great ally Brezhnev died, and he was replaced by Andropov, uh, Yuri Andropov. And uh, there was a fairly good relationship there, I think, well, or at least amicable relationship. Uh, but Andropov, as you know, didn't last long. And then Cherenenko uh, took the helm, who was in an equally bad physical and, I suppose, mental condition to uh, Andropov. And uh, they had a really terrible relationship. In fact, I think they despised each other. So we see this situation from here on where Honecker starts to gaze more towards the West, and you'll see in his, if you, well, it's covered quite extensively, he starts traveling more to Western countries, making up contacts, making contacts with uh, uh, notable European leaders, also even visits the Vatican. So his, his gaze is on the Western world, and he starts kind of turning away from Moscow, realizing, I think he realizes, it's a fading power. And I can imagine relationships with the Soviet Union don't get any better with Gorbachev arriving on the scene either. Of course, uh, once uh, Cherenenko died, uh, we had the the elevation of Mikhail Gorbachev, who had been one of his assistants, and Honecker knew Gorbachev. They'd had a relationship. They knew each other. Uh, Gorbachev had been an advisor and worked in the Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, so they were aware of each other, but Honecker, I, I don't think, was p- particularly... He said at the time, you know, he welcomed this breath of fresh air when Gorbachev was elevated to, to office, but um, uh, it soon became clear that his new policies of glasnost... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> were not the kind of thing that Eric Honecker was impressed by, and he, he didn't make um, any bones about that. Also, of course, there were other problems, domestic matters which shook him. Uh, the the Bell disco attack, this was a um, when uh, Libyan terrorists literally used the East German, their embassy in East Berlin, as a base for planning terrorist attacks, including uh, bombing a a uh, nightclub in the West where American soldiers were. Then th- the economy was impacted again because of the Chernobyl disaster. I mean, that was a huge hit to the Soviet Union and, of course, to East Germany. Green activists started to make their voices heard because the, the East Germany was filthy, a filthy, polluted country where um, rivers were polluted by chemicals and disgusting black, uh, th- this brown... This brown sulfuric type coal polluted the atmosphere. I remember being there at the time when, uh, in, in 1990, 1990, being in East Germany and seeing how filthy 
and how dilapidated the whole place was. I mean, it was a horrible country to look at. Uh, if you went into East Berlin uh, and also went down to Leipzig at the time, I remember this was 1890, it was filthy. Nothing was painted. It was so drab. So the, he, he started to hear more and more from activists about, you know, I think Chernobyl prompted that a little bit, about what a, what a disgusting environment it was. Um, you could take somewhere like I, I think I cover this in the in the book somewhere like Bitterfeld, which was like this di- this district in in Saxony, oh, just filled with chemical factories, all using coal based products. They manufactured pesticides, dyes, uh, plastics, and they literally turned the surrounding countryside into the, this great big hazardous landscape. Uh, the, in the air, it was ash and soot and dust and chlorine and hydrochloric acid. Um, and the, this was being belched out 24 hours a day. And the residents were suffering. There were every, many kids and, and, and pensioners were suffering uh, ailments to the eyes. There were lung and skin diseases. Um, there were differences in newborns, their size and weight. And uh, I think at the time, Greenpeace said the, the air in Leipzig was twice as dirty as the air in Dusseldorf in West Germany. And um, as all this was going on, gradually the the relationship with Mikhail Gorbachev, who was sweeping away with his re- reforms, got worse. Gorbachev th- threatened to stop uh, uh, delivering oil unless Honecker paid with hard currency. This was really kind of unusual stuff, but it showed how, how bad the relationship was between the GDR and uh, the Soviet Union at, at this point. And uh, the bottom line was that Honecker refused um, to um, follow these reforms. He followed to, to to open up, and um, I think the rift, the rift was there. We had also similar attitude from uh, Ceausescu in Romania, uh, who also thought uh, that that Gorbachev was harebrained and and watched with horror at uh, Perestroika and Glasnost and the state of the Soviet Union. Now, one of his major achievements during this period is his first and uh, only visit to West Germany, but he's health is starting to decline as well in the late 80s. Even though I'm talking about it briefly, the book is 100,000 words, so it does go into some detail uh, throughout the 80s because a lot happens there. But one of the uh, key moments, as far as Eric Honecker is concerned, is his trip to West Germany in September 1987. He had been trying for years uh, to um, conduct a visit to the West, and uh, it had been thwarted by Cherenenko and and Dropov before him, and uh, lots of different things had also scuppered in the situation in Poland, uh, uh, other uh, domestic crises as well. So anyway, it actually was realised in September 1987, and 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 it it looked like every it wasn't a state visit, but it looked like a state visit. Uh, Honecker flew into Bonn Airport. The flags were up, the band was uh, playing, the red carpet was rolled out, and um, Honecker basically charmed his way through West Germany, went to his hometown, Wiebelskirchen, and uh, managed to secure some uh, deals as well for business and for industry. Uh, So it was a very good moment in the career of Eric Honecker. Um, The same year also is when his health started to fail. Uh, He really did start to suffer a lack of vitality. He had flu quite often. He was in hospital with uh, kidney problems and colic. And uh, he even looked sick. You could see that um, he he was, he'd lost a lot of weight. He'd, he'd lost a lot of hair as well. Uh, he was very gaunt and he really he, uh, aged very quickly between uh, 1986 and, and 1988. And you can see that if you go through pictures of, of Honecker or watch his speeches, you can even hear his voices getting a lot weaker. This situation wasn't helped by the economy going from bad to worse. Basically, the German Democratic Republic was teetering on the brink of economic collapse. They were living on subsidies and loans from uh, Western countries. The Soviet Union was, uh, you know, the wolf was at the door of the Soviet Union and Gorbachev was suffering from his perestroika and and his glasnost, as as is well known. And um, the winds of change were blowing through Eastern Europe. And throughout this period, Eric Honecker uh, was a sick man and, and getting worse. Public attitudes in East Germany are beginning to 
change. And just as with uh, deposing Walter Albrecht, Honecker's protege Egon Krentz is also plotting his downfall. Just about everything that could go wrong uh, during the final years of Honecker's uh, tenure did go wrong. There were sham elections, uh, stuffed ballot boxes in local elections. Uh, This marked a turning point in public attitudes uh, because there was this wind of change, uh, you know, blowing through uh, the Baltic countries and through Eastern Europe. East Germans, too, were affected by this. And the, many of them were no longer intimidated by threats or state violence, and they made their feelings clear about the elections, these sham elections, you know. And they demonstrated and they, they called it uh, what, what it was, you know, a fraud. Then there was the 40th anniversary of the GDR, something which Honecker was keen to celebrate in style. Uh, Mikhail Gorbachev was invited, many dignitaries were there at the Palace of the Republic to celebrate this Uh, auspicious occasion. Uh, On the sidelines of it, Gorbachev urged Honecker to make reforms. And he said to him, say something to the audience, uh, you know, that that change is in the air here too, like it is in other countries. Give them some hope. Honecker absolutely refused to do that and gave uh, one of his usual old speeches about the future being bright, uh, the economy will recover, etc., etc. And I think many people in the audience, as Europe was changing, the world was changing, Honecker was giving a speech which he could have given 20 years earlier. Um, anyway, this sparked more protests. There were actually protests that night in Berlin, and then soon after there were 70,000 protesters in Leipzig demanding change. And after a while, Honecker's decrepitude and his attitude uh, all became a little bit too much, especially for the Politburo. They realized that their own jobs were on the line as they were watching the situation changing. And in the end, it was Honecker's own protege, his, you know, Egon Krenz, his man, just as he had been to Walter Ulbricht, uh, that uh, that did the deadly deed, so to speak, uh, with the blessing of Gorbachev. Uh, He uh, helped to eject Honecker. During a uh, a very tense Politburo meeting, Honecker was stunned by the whole thing, filled with betrayal and hurt, and and retired to Wandlitz. So literally packed his office up in a cardboard box, you know, his items, and, and was driven home. Um, then there were allegations of corruption. He was put under house arrest. Eventually, he and Margot managed to escape to Moscow, helped by the then Russian. A government which was still under Gorbachev's, um, uh, the Gorbachev administration. But anyway, after reunification, Honecker is extradited against his will, almost forced from uh, Russia to face charges related to deaths at the Berlin Wall. So he's flown back in to Berlin and taken straight to Moabit Prison in, in, in the center of Berlin, where he had been as a young man, actually, and um, put on trial, a, a trial he described as a, travet- a travesty of justice. He said it was all political theatre. You can imagine this, Honecker being brought back from Moscow. There was a huge media frenzy. It, it was uh, pointed out in Bild Zeitung and all the kind of tabloidy press that this was the uh, first German head of state to be put on trial in over 800 years. Uh, the The only other one, I think, they mentioned was Admiral Donitz, of course, uh, Hitler's successor. His lawyers, who I spoke to uh, whilst, whilst researching this book, Nicholas Becker, remembered that Honecker was at his best during his trial, even though he was sick. He was by this point suffering with cancer. Uh, he was uh, fragile uh, and, of course, in a pretty bad mental state. He was in prison, in a pretty awful prison in the centre of Berlin, uh, fighting for his freedom. But his lawyer remembered he was uh, uh, a little bit like a young revolutionary at the time, and he gave his best speech in court, and he, he was up for the fight. And uh, he remembered that, uh, you know, many of his clients used to be whiny. He said Honecker was completely different to that. He was, you know, quite a fighter. Anyway, the trial went on and on and on, and it was very sluggish because his co-defendants, other members of the Politburo, who at this time, uh, in, including his head of security, were, were also in the dock and uh, they were all in pretty poor health and after 169 days in custody the trial was just dogged by blunders and it finally ended in January 1993. Honecker was released and literally on the same day he got on a plane to Chile where uh, he joined his wife Margot 
and his daughter. And um, he was kind of welcomed something as a, as a hero um, uh, when when he got there. The Communist Party laid out the red carpet on the on on the airstrip, and uh, he moved into a little house in a compound uh, in the, in the capital. And um, uh, from there on, his 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 health uh, spiraled downwards. What are his remaining years like in Chile? Uh, he's with Margot, reunited with Margot. That's pretty much it as far as Eric Honecker's career is concerned. He he is now a, a pensioner, a sick man. He's in need of care, constant care. He has very low blood pressure. He has uh, cancer, which is gradually eating away at him. Uh, so he's bedridden for much of the time in Chile. But that's not to say that he doesn't have a social life as well. He gets a lot of visitors, certainly from um, uh, sympathetic regimes in in, in the uh, South American region. Also, the family receive a lot of contributions from countries such as, a gen- donations, so to speak, from countries such as uh, uh, Korea and uh, Cuba. Um, so he still has friends. And so does Margot, and uh, they they uh, have a healthy, lively correspondence with friends back in Germany. Margot misses the weather; she doesn't miss Germany, but she misses the cold weather. Uh, Honecker misses missed the press. I mean, he used to listen to Deutsche Welle, the German radio on shortwave, and get the newspapers sent a few days later. But he said the Germany that that he was seeing being born after reunification was a the German a Germany he didn't want to be part of. He gave a few interviews to magazines, bitter interviews, criticizing Gorbachev and Krentz and the the fall of the wall. Gradually though, his health uh, got worse and worse. He turned down a last minute operation in May uh, 1994. By this point he really couldn't even communicate or stand up. Uh, the end came on the 29th of May 1994 in the presence of his wife and daughter. And uh, that, that's when he died, and there was a funeral a few days later, a big turnout organised by the Communist Party, and uh, there, were, there were even tributes. North Korea's Kim Il-sung uh, sent a telegram, and uh, so, did, uh, so did others from the uh, former communist world. And his urn containing his ashes uh, remained with Margot, who continued to live a, a peaceful life in Chile. What happened to Margot? She... Um, herself succumbed to cancer in 2016 uh, and and she had per particularly uh, aggressive uh, breast cancer uh, and she died in uh, Chile she was uh, for the part for the final year she was under round the clock ca- care from nurses uh, some of the uh, press coverage was quite unhealthy I think at the time built newspaper Bild Zeitung which is the big daily tabloid in Germany uh, greeted her demise with the the headline no tears for the purple witch Egon Krenz um, the man who took over from Hanukkah uh, was sentenced to six and a half years in prison on four counts of manslaughter connected with uh, East Germans trying to cross the Berlin Wall. Um, he, like Honecker, said that it, the trial was Victor's justice, a kind of witch hunt as well. Um, and uh, he, he's now still alive. He, he's, he's retired. He's up on the Baltic. The book is called The Man Who Built the Berlin Wall by Nathan Morley. There's links in the episode notes where you can buy the book and support the podcast. Don't miss the episode extras such as videos, photos and other content. Just look for the link in the podcast information. The podcast wouldn't exist without the generous support of our financial supporters and I'd like to thank one and all of them for keeping the podcast on the road. The Cold War Conversation continues in our Facebook discussion group. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thanks very much for listening and see you next week.